it's great to have you here. And again, I hope you're all uh, staying safe and, and, and healthy during this, these extraordinary times. Uh, and I think it's the perfect time, and I'm very happy you're, you're joining us, uh, to talk about the power of private capital to spark novel solutions uh, that confront social and environmental problem, problems. And we are going to have a very special guest today, uh, Fabio Segura from the Jacobs Foundation. I will introduce him, him in a little bit. Uh, to talk about SDG4 and some of the very specific challenges that that work uh, in this arena or, or that work when you address SDGs. Last week, we had a webinar and we talked about systemic view of the SDGs and the 17th SDGs. And today we're going to focus on SDG4. So if you're a little bit like me and you've been in confinement, had the privilege of actually to be in confinement because a lot of people are in the streets uh, working and do not also have the privilege to do that. Uh, maybe you resorted to this pretty amazing superfood that is chocolate. Uh, to and and we actually use chocolate in many special occasions for for presents, for gifts, for love. You know, and and we tend to associate it with very happy memories and with uh, with rewards many times. But what would happen if you know that the chocolate that you're actually eating comes from places where children are working and in many cases in very hazardous solutions and in situations where uh, child labor is utilized and is interfering on their well-being, on their education and the possibilities of a, of a, of a better future. So if we talk about or when we think about the chocolate, there is a lot more behind chocolate. And I think something that may arise very well from this uh, COVID crisis is to understand much better the importance and the value of a resilient value chain, you know, and what is behind the products and the goods and services we have. Another issue that I think comes to mind is also education, since most schools around, uh, around the world, I think only in Sweden is not the case, uh, are closed. And many of the schools had to put everything online, obviously with inequality that comes out with that because some people do not have access and uh, or even if they have access they don't have the, the right environment uh, to flourish in an online environment so we all worry and in my case uh, my two daughters I have teenage daughters started working uh, online and I wonder many times if professors or teachers were actually trained and, and able to give quality education for that. Just by chance, yesterday I received, and since I told you I love chocolate, I can brag a little bit about my daughter too today. I received a note from the school, again, from my very privileged life, telling that Ella and Zoe have been doing very well in this demanding environment, etc., and how the quality of the education is not being, is not suffering. But clearly, this is not something that, that everybody can afford, you know? So talking about, uh, even from my beautiful home with a beautiful garden and, and, and having my daughters with uh, access to quality education is one of the luxuries that probably most of us that are sitting here in this webinar have and sometimes we may take for granted. So I think the special issue we're going to talk today and we have really a very special speaker uh, and that is uh, Fabio Segura from the Jacobs Foundation uh, it's really a very difficult topic to, to try to understand how do you invest and how do you, can you assure more equity when we talk about SDG4 and quality education. Now, Fabio has been with the Jacobs Foundation since 2015, where he was the head of international programs. And since July of 2000, 2019, he's a co-CEO. And in, before he joined Actually, the Jacobs Foundation, he was a senior investment manager at LGT Venture Philanthropy, where he worked on uh, investment operations in Latin America. And even before that, and I think what I love about his background is precisely that mix of that you're going to see now. He also served in, in Colombia uh, for peace as a peace and development worker. You know, and he collaborated. He was a consultant for international organizations in like UNICEF, UNEP, FAO, etc. So... And really, he combines this feel and this commitment uh, to, to improving the conditions of communities with the financial ground, the background, and it's really a privilege to have you here, Fabio. So, Pleasure in, to be here, Vanina. That is good. So in this 
COVID crisis brought also something since we're starting to talk about the reopening. Uh, there are now, um, if you look at the European environment, we are talking a lot about what corporates are doing. So what are you going to get from this? If you are a corporate, if you are from, from our IMD network, what are you get from this webinar? And a little bit of the idea for me is to really support you and to get pick the brain of Fabio on how can corporations transform. I, I participated in an, I, a couple just two days ago or one day ago, and the head of uh, investment analysis from Trios Bank, and he will be here in another webinar in, in, in May. Uh, he actually mentioned, and part of a recommendation, he said, as we start the recovery, recovery governments should actually select which companies they are going to help and they're going to support. So if we know that companies are damaging the environment, we should not be supporting them. And investors should also be proactive when they put private capital in corporations and when we, to gear and to support the transition towards sustainability. So uh, I thought that this was a very provoking a kind of a very pro provoking graph, you no? Know? And so, how can we think of how can we move private capital with a purpose, you know, with intention? We talk a lot about intention in, when we talk about impact investing, in order to uh, work on SDG four. And SDG four sadly has very specific uh, challenges. If you look, and you don't, I know this can be relatively small in your screen, but just so you look, this is a, an, an evaluation or a graph that was showing how uh, what was how the evolution on SDG investment was going for the SDGs. And SDG 4 is actually here at the bottom. And if you look, the tendencies actually started relatively well, but the investment is dropping. No, so there is less, uh, really, it's not gaining momentum. And we hope that after the COVID crisis, this will actually change. But it is a hard SDG to pull money, and Fabio will tell us a little, a little bit more why. So this, since you have joined, we have almost 170 people. This will be the first webinar where we actually give you money to invest. Okay, it's fake money. It's webinar money. No? But we are going to ask you to do a little poll. So you are, think that you are a sustainability executive of a mid-sized chocolate company, and we just gave you 200K to invest in sustainability in, in, in cocoa. You know? So where would you invest? And you have this option. So I will open the poll right now for you to choose. And you can use, choose one. So we'll force you to choose just one. So we have 44% will actually uh, decide to put the 200K to increase the farmer's income value. And then another almost 37, 40% building schools, so infrastructure. So we build schools to give access in community. And then we have with 15% uh, helping farmers, uh, children increase reading and then reducing deforestation. And last but not least, the healthy chocolate side that, <laughs> that inspired me this morning. If we're gonna think about this, how do you, how do, you do this? No, you know, we are seeing that it's not easy to decide. So what, one of the reasons that made, and with this, I will finish up uh, the, the topics that, 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 I'm, that I'm talking, uh, is just to share one concept, and it's the concept of materiality. You know? So when we see in sustainability or, or a lot on ESG integration, there is a lot of research showing right now that companies that focus their sustainability efforts on material issues actually perform better. Uh, they align the the impact with the financial return so there is a push and there is a lot of effort from companies to really focus on material issues what is materiality materiality is an accounting concept uh, it came from accounting it's really the issues that uh, substantially affect an organization in the short medium and long term when we move from the financial sector and you have SASB materiality map that you can check uh, you will have the reference it is really those issues that affect the financial and the operational performance. And if you look at GRI, that we're starting to look at integrated reported, it added the idea, those issues that also influence stakeholders. So when you need to pick from the broad arena of uh, ESG or sustainability issues, the idea is that you should pick issues 
that are financially material and that matter to your stakeholders too. The problem with this is when companies think about education, uh, what happens in, in this area is that if you look and you look at materiality, I was saying, you know, substrate materiality, SDG 4 really is material in just four of the topics. And it is the one that is the lowest at all. And if you look at GRE uh, crossing between the, the issues that you have to report and SDGs, only in two areas, and one is employee development, so really will not be child labor, and the other is community engagement. So really very few. When for other SDGs, you really have lots of interest or lots of, um, I would say, alignment with material issues. So uh, since we are here, we clearly see that uh, there is, a problem. So Fabio, how do you deal with this? Because you have you are working precisely on building a collaborative solution with 11 companies or with the industry of cocoa industry. So how do you get them or how do you work and how do you get them to focus on quality of education? Excellent. Uh, thank you very much uh, and welcome everyone to this call. It's a pleasure to, to be um, in presence of so many people from around the world. To answer your question, Vanina, um, we have to build a bridge between the promise of education and what is material for businesses, be it a risk they're facing, be it a cost that they're incurring in, or be it a, a better way of doing business or a future way of business. And so this is what we've tried to do and where the presentation today focuses on how we have tried to build that business case in the cocoa and chocolate industry. Excellent. So I love a quote that you that you presented and that you are going to talk about with us so so why does quality education matter why because you, we have all the other options and you've seen it was our third option it was more about building schools uh, about so what are the needs what what can you tell us well quality education matters for many reasons um, basically the promise of education is one that societies and individuals will um, be better off with quality education there is nothing that has been more documented in terms of social change for individuals, it leads to better income, it leads to holding for longer term, better quality jobs for societies means income distribution. However, how do you translate those macroeconomic benefits um, to having an individual company with a profit seeking uh, interest and a mission to invest on it? Um, that is where you have all of the materiality issues you have been discussing. A, it is perceived to be the matter of state. B, it is um, the, the benefits of that materializing are too far in time. And C, there's a free riders dilemma. So if you as a single company invest in a community and the benefits of that are shared widely amongst your competitors or basically you're not capturing them, there's no way in which you can make that business case before your board and, and investment committees. So how has the data evolved uh, on quality education and what research, because I know when you choose the type of interventions that you're going to make and that are going to be working, you have worked with a lot of research. What is the data and you, that you share with us that you can share with our, our participants today? Excellent. So in this slide, if you can take the, the cover of the, of the graph here, that'd be great. In this graph, you can see how uh, education has really grown tremendously over the last 200 years. Um, you have seen here the numbers of primary education students grow faster than any other sector. However, secondary and university students are also growing. In the gaps here, you see the World War um, periods, and also probably we're going to see one of those periods now in the last few weeks because 1.5 billion learners have stopped going to, to schools. However, if you go to the next slide, you will see that there is an issue um, with education today, and it is that most systems around the world, independently of high or low uh, income countries, um, are failing a vast majority of, of students. A, because we're not learning the basics on, uh, during primary education. B, because students are not um, uh, prepared to enter the school and then they're missing their developmental potential and see because um, basically students are not staying in schools given the lack of relevance, the lack of ability of their parents to um, uh, finance their attendance to it and the lack of uh, infrastructure around them. So if you look at the next slide, the other thing that we know is that 
Um, there are three main reasons why this is the case. A, we already talked about uh, infrastructure, school supply, training of teachers, and, and also uh, macro uh, social events like conflicts and crisis. So insufficient access remains in these days a major barrier for quality. The second one is the, the relevance, um, um, the, the, um, uh, the instruction within classrooms and the quality of the materials as well as the pedagogy, as well as the management of um, the education matter per se is very low. And lastly, there is lack of accountability because uh, many uneducated or illiterate parents have no means to assess the outcome and the quality of the education. Um, and beyond that, many um, are unable to trace the government's decision-making as well as the effectiveness of the programs or the packages that they're choosing. So these are some of the challenges and historic data that we're seeing. So how, how, how do you do it then? How, how do you build a coalition to speed up this change? What data do you see additional that, that, that can work with it? Well, at the macroeconomic level, one of the things that we've done is just to trace um, the correlation between uh, education and gross domestic product or, or GDP. So one of our um, uh, researchers, Professor Hanuchek, Eric Hanuchek, has been studied, studying uh, for, for a long time uh, countries' um, GDP increase as well as per capita years of schooling. And if you can show that slide, that'd be great. Um, here in the, in, the, in the top right, top left corner, you see um, in the axis, in the X axis, is years of school per capita. And in the uh, uh, Y axis, you see uh, increasing GDP. And I'm not expecting you to read that. Each of these dots represents a country, and the data here represented is 40 years of, of evolution on both sides. So you see a direct correlation between education growth in terms of years per capita and, and, and gross domestic product of 0.58 percentage point. Now, that is to imagine that education in Norway or education in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire have the same quality, and oftentimes they don't. So one other way of looking at it is to see the standardized test results. And what you can see here on the top right corner on the, on the X um, axis is standard deviations in test scores. It is this, how much can we improve performance of students in um, tests like PISA? And you can see that the correlation is much higher. It's two percentage points if you can increase one standard deviation in those tests. So if you control one against the other, if you just want to know how much does a year of schooling in uh, absence of quality education contribute to GDP is almost zero. So this is the bottom left corner, zero years. And for many countries in the world where you are not paying attention to quality of education, all of that investment is producing zero returns for the economy. Now, the good news, and we can go to the next slide, is that we can actually see with very minor uh, standard deviation increase, a very direct uh, increase in GDP of up to 20 per, up to 30 percent in 20 to 30 year uh, uh, reforms. And the other good news there is that it doesn't depend on how much money do you have to invest in. It invest it depends more on what you do with that money. Good. So I think I find very interesting. And as you see, we had many many of the people investing on building infrastructure. So we do need to have access. And you mentioned it as a problem, but it's not only that. So just if we don't improve the quality, obviously it's very clear that we will not have a correlation so so how do you do it because as you mentioned sometimes it's hard uh, the investment may take time and to know how quality of education affect lives so to really convince a corporate to invest in this idea of long term because when you see a school is there you build it etc so how this problem between an activity or an income and an out an output and an outcome how that affects and what, what is the journey you know so what is important when you build a, a fund in order to affect and to have a positive income on quality education. Great. So I would like to share with you the journey that we have taken in, in Côte d'Ivoire, where 40% of the world's cocoa comes from, and where you see all of the multinational and medium-sized, large-sized, small companies uh, involved in the business of, uh, of cocoa and um, cocoa production and then chocolate transformation. This is where the supply chain of cocoa begins. Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana together accounting for the majority of the cocoa of the world. So um, let's start with the one thing that you said. When we arrived in 2015 to try and talk about quality education, that was the first thing we heard from government and from companies. Why would you be talking about quality education when there are not schools? 
So you have to first build schools. And that's why the choices made in this webinar by all of you present here are very much reflecting the choices being made by companies in many, in many domains. Firstly, you need to be aware that there is a, a, an issue of poverty of farmers producing cocoa. These are not companies hiring personnel to work in plantations. These are smallholder farmers trying to produce, uh, uh, sometimes in, in, in suboptimal, um, uh, let's say, size uh, cocoa. But also there is lack of infrastructure, not only schools, uh, hospitals, wells, and so on. And so the dilemma that seems to be obvious um, uh, in the eyes of policy and decision makers is you either build infrastructure or you work on quality. And what we're trying to bring here is a different dimension that you have to work on both. Otherwise, all of your investment will be uh, uh, generating negative returns. We have some questions of how do you measure uh, quality education? So what, what kind of, uh, because we talked about for impact investing, you need intention, SDG, but you also need to measure your outcomes. You know? Absolutely. So how do you do that? Well, the most uh, direct way of measuring quality education, and this is not a perfect pro pro uh, proxy, but it's uh, uh, is the is the best and more efficient way we have to do it is to measure at the primary education level numeracy and literacy. This is to say, uh, how many words can you read? Can you understand a basic sentence when you see it? Can you do a double-digit uh, um, um, simple uh, mathematical equation? And um, just to give you an illustration of where the basis is in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, in, in a very uh, well-structured school with infrastructure in place and so on, we did a test at the beginning of our, of our program, and of 100 students, only 20 were able to read a sentence. Um, uh, sorry, only 20% only were able to um, go to the reading of words, but they could not understand a sentence and they could not uh, even spell uh, uh, words correctly. So the ability of students, especially those in, in rural areas, to, um, to get the basics out of quality education is, is very low in place. For that, so we created the TREC program. Exactly. How, Sorry, what is go the ahead. Track? No, no, I was precisely going to ask you that. What is the TREC program? <laughs> Sorry, you read the my track program, <laughs> The TREC program is an approach we, we um, created to try and work in parallel with government, with civil society, and with industry, and take evidence to action, so to, to, to test innovations on the field, and then taking the innovation results to practice and to policy. So on one hand, to try and, and influence the way companies see their own sustainability and the way the government makes policy based on innovations um, and based on, uh, on evidence. Mm -hmm. So, oops, sorry. So why do you need this? How do you do it? Well, firstly, we... Um, 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 partnered with the government to see what were their policy objectives, what were their um, um, plans, and what were their aimed uh, um, uh, target results for education, and what were their priorities. And then we went around the world looking for models that would be able to support this government in this context in doing that, also locally, of course. And we came up with 3,600 models that would be able to address some of the issues that they were facing. With the government, then we narrowed this down to a list of 20 models from ECD, or Early Childhood Development, to primary education, to vocational training. And with this sub-list that was vetted with the government, by the government, we then went to uh, the cocoa and chocolate industry and started testing ways in which they could um, participate with us and, and try to roll them out along their supply chains and in line with their sustainability strategies. And what were the main barriers that you think were identified? Yeah. So, yes, we, we started asking cocoa and chocolate executives back in 2016, um, not only what were their main uh, barriers, but why would they invest in quality education? First and foremost, um, everyone who was doing something on education, and it's also very aligned with the poll here, was building infrastructure. Um, so um, beyond infrastructure building, there was very little done. But... Um, uh, the, 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 the main reasons for that were um, regulatory pressure uh, to end child labor. There were um, um, also ethical concerns that they had, and they were also preparing the next and future generations of cocoa uh, farmers. But the barriers were also very clear. The first of them was a lack of trust, um, and a lack of trust in government particularly, but also a lack of trust with each other. So um, they felt that by investing in quality education, they were taking over the role the government has legitimately given itself, and um, it is also the obligation uh, um, of, of states to, to care for it. A second important barrier was that 
Companies that produce chocolate um, and, 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 and transform cocoa don't necessarily know what works and uh, what is effective in increasing learning outcomes. So lack of knowledge was a very clear barrier um, that we had to overcome as well. And the third one was that the perception of benefits from this investment in education was materializing too far away in time. So if you talk about the 20-year reform, a 10-year reform, um, you're um, you know, not speaking to the year of executives who have to make decisions and expect a return or a result of that uh, investment in months from the moment in which those funds are uh, um, placed. We, just, Lastly, we have here uh, sorry, a question precisely on that from C. Batruch, and he's actually, how do you determine that a, which company and why a company should be part of a CSR program on education or, a found, or, or should they do it through the foundation or why would corporate, and it's something you were mentioning before, why, a, why would a corporate, a corporate get involved in something that you would maybe say that the, the government or the state should take care of? So what do you and think? that's precisely that's precisely at the bottom of, of this building of the business case. First and foremost, we don't believe in CSR. So corporate social responsibility uh, is something we try to avoid at the Jacko Foundation because that's something you do because you're you know somebody feels nice of doing it and it's the first thing that gets diminished or killed in the face of a crisis like we're seeing today. We believe in core business investment. So in order for us to make the business case for investing, we have to make it appealable and valuable enough for companies to be able to put money that would actually come in despite crisis and because they are seeing the direct benefit and direct return to their business. And so this is how we have approached it. And therefore, we don't decide whether a company should um, be a part of a program we promote. We invite companies. And for those whom uh, see the business case, um, we welcome them on board and work with them. And I think it's interesting because we talked again now, uh, resilient and working with value change is becoming a, a, a key and a core issue, but the problems were there before. And we have a question from okay. Ravi there, also asking, uh, do companies over market this? Maybe they do some greenwashing. Do they use it for marketing or uh, building their image? Uh, and that could actually be, be favorable too, because it's part of aligning if they're actually investing and, and creating the positive impact. So do they get to capitalize on the growing or, 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 or what they do uh, in their businesses? Effectively, companies use this in their sustainability reports. They use this before their shareholders and their uh, boards to uh, basically talk about their effort in addressing some of the challenges of their of their business. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I think uh, in order for us to really blend finance and address big issues, we need uh, uh, capital from the private sector, from government, and from the philanthropic sector and civil society. So in order for us to be able to blend that effectively, we need to be serving different interests. And one of the interests is that companies who invest there get a return. What is one currency? Credibility, shareholder value, and uh, uh, image and brand positioning. So how, because we talked a lot about corporates, but I know you, you actually have been working in a grand coalition, like you're mentioning now. You have government, you have United Nations organizations like the International Labor Organization or UNICEF. And you have 11 companies in the cocoa industry from Nestle, Mars, uh, Mendeleev. I'm going to forget because there are 11, so you can't mention, sorry, or <laughs> Barry Calibot, and, 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 and the government in Cote d'Ivoire. So how do you build this multi-stakeholder collaboration to actually build a financial or a blended finance tool to address and to bring solutions to market? You know, how, how do you do that? What is this co-investors approach that, right. that I think is quite innovative that I wanted to share with the audience? So in order for us to really be building a business case, firstly, we had to um, create a coalition of stakeholders that would act as co-investors. And that meant having clearly defined roles for each of the parties and having clearly defined um, targets and uses of the capital that we would go into uh, pull together. The second part was about choosing um, real and effective models, therefore um, overcoming the barrier of not knowing enough about what works and what doesn't in education. So bringing that knowledge to the table and making it easier for those investors, the different stakeholders, government, multilateral organizations and companies to actually choose the right ones. And the third part of that was to give um, um, increased 
visibility and value proposition um, to mitigate a business risk. In this case, the business risk that was very evident, evident for the cocoa and chocolate industry was the upcoming regulation or is the upcoming regulation uh, to tackle the issue of child labor in their supply chain. So building the bridge between increasing quality of education and diminishing child labor was an important uh, material aspect that actually made quality of education traditionally not a sector where companies put their money in, quite relevant uh, in this current uh, date and time. Good. So if you, if, again, if you, how, how do you put this together? What is behind and can you tell us a little bit more uh, how you build? And I think we had, sorry, I think we had, uh, because I thought the, the chat is going like crazy and the Q&A is going like crazy. We had two previous questions that I, I may, uh, try to address for that I need to get out of here uh, and one was how do you deal with teachers because sometimes there is a bottleneck of teachers for the quality education uh, and there was another uh, how do you choose is that are the investors or the corporates deciding what quality education is or do you have people on the field and you co-create with the communities that you work with and then we go back and, and get into the into the previous great one. So the first question about teachers, this is a very relevant one because teachers and teacher quality, teacher training is one of the most essential aspects of quality of education. Now that I am a daytime teacher and a nighttime co-CEO, I can see why and I can see the challenges of teaching when you have uh, un malnourished children, uh, when you have oversized classrooms and when you yourself don't have material or training to, to uh, conduct that, that labor. So one of the things that we do, and you will see uh, in, in this presentation, a small clip on that is um, provide them with methods that allow them to resolve the teaching um, by having other students support each other in their learning process by going at their own level. Uh, one example of that is teaching at the right level, a methodology created by Pratham, a very large Indian NGO that has helped over 60 million children uh, learn better through that methodology. So we can talk about that later. But the one interesting case that somebody's asking about, um, do we have people on the ground conducting all of these processes and, and going in the field and, and carrying this out? Well, we don't. We have a very small team in Cote d'Ivoire. Here in Zurich, we have three people who are um, uh, basically managing this program. Um, and what we have done is leverage on the on the ground personnel that cocoa and chocolate industry has had. So they all have cooperative work. They all have managers on the ground. And we have managed to have them be a part of the process of rolling out and managing the process per se. Also, the government has participated through their own networks, as well as the NGOs and implementers that we have on the ground. So can you tell us a little bit how how this funds, so how, how it is created, how the cooperation, because I know there is the Jacobs Foundation, there is the UBS Optimus Foundation, you have different corporates. So can you tell me a little bit how Trek partners, who they are and how they co-invest and what it is? Excellent. So in this graph, you see the uh, blended finance that uh, we have created to date. And the bottom yellow part is the Jacobs Foundation investment. We committed 50 million um, Swiss francs or US dollars to conduct a transformation that will have three objectives. One, create a business case for investing in quality education. The second one was to transform education in the country. And the third one is to transform also the way um, philanthropic, the philanthropic sector and philanthropic institutions work. So on top of that, you'll see other foundations like UBS Optimus Foundation and Bernard Fundler Foundation using all their, all their capital and adding funds to a program we created with a, with a team on the ground that was not a Jacobs Foundation team. It was a, a, a self-entity who, uh, who was tasked with maintaining government relationships and ensuring that the funds were used adequately. And on top of that, you see all of the funding that has come by virtue of creating that business case for others to invest. One of the examples this, that we did was... Sorry, is this the money coming from the foundation, like a paper performance? How is it? What is exactly. it? Or is to the risk? Uh, just if you can mention a little bit on... Sure, and I was, I was good to go there. The, the first thing okay, we did sorry. with the cocoa and chocolate industry was to create a payment by results mechanism. Right. And that is to say, if you achieve these results, these previously agreed results, we will pay this money towards that program. If you don't achieve them, we'll pay less or not at all. And so only five companies, when we started that process, only four companies were brave enough to say, we'll take the challenge of publicly committing to results and then publicly being judged for whether we got there or not. And we felt that was great because there were four of the giant companies in the multinational space that you can, you can, you can see um, in all the media. 
However, we wanted to transform the entire chocolate industry. So we changed the approach and we said, hey, we will take the risk ourselves. We will fund these models that we know from evidence work. And if we manage to make them work in your supply chains, then we together commit to taking them to scale at the next level. And that was uh, what we call the, the, the second wave of funding, um, which got us together with nine cocoa and chocolate industries, practically the majority of the provision of cocoa and chocolate in the world that was represented in this group. And beyond that, we started mobilizing capital. You see here the blue, big, tall uh, uh, stack there from multilaterals like World Bank, who um, also had an interest in making programs more aligned with private sector money. And so we had for the first time the opportunity to create out of these pilots national programs that would really impact um, um, policies at scale. But we thought we still hadn't created the business case for investing in quality education. And I think this is very interesting because part of what this webinar is about is precisely how this blended finance uh, solutions, you, the, the philanthropic money can work as a de-risking de part of the process, but the private money, money is leveraged to scale and to bring corporate transformation because we know that the cocoa industry also wants to change and it's very, there's a lot of scrutiny around a value chain issues. So how you align all those incentives and how you do it uh, in order uh, to, to really achieve the, the goal that is quality education. So how did you build that case? Because there are still well, these different pieces were working. I mean, but how, with, with how the figures that you're, it's not with you, the figures you you're seeing all, here. I would say, no? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> with the figures you're seeing here, um, there's a huge problem, and it is that we're still working with each company individually. So we're working with companies paying by results or taking to scale within their supply chain these models. But if we want to really make a dent on the issue and transform the situation at a national level, we needed to work with them together. And to prove that business case, if you go to the next slide, we will talk a little yeah, bit about I'm that. Trying, but we have to. My computer got stuck a bit, <sighs> so I'm trying <laughs> to get out. No worries. That's great. So if you keep talking, and I'll try to fix it. Okay. <laughs> so to get to that next level, we had to prove that companies were willing to put money into a pot that was not in their control, as investors do with a company, and then they transfer control to management. That would actually be real money and not only uh, managing the process or um, let's say transferring some of their programs to this program, but actual cash. And um, we basically created two pool funding facilities with the support of the UBS Optimus Foundation, and they are called CLE and ELAN. CLE stands for Child, Labor, Child Learning and Education Facility, and ELAN for Early Learning and Nutrition. And we told companies, we are willing to put in a significant amount of funding um, towards a capitalization, a target capitalization of 150 million. If you as an industry um, are willing to also do their part, your part and, and, and contribute equally. So we're asking them to put in some like 25 million, the government some 25 million, we would commit 25 million and then we would look for funding from other sources in, uh, in an equivalent amount. The board of the Jacobs Foundation challenged us very critically on this and said, if by end of February, um, you have not obtained letters of interest from the cocoa and chocolate industry for at least 15 million, we've simply dropped the process. We will claim that we have failed in this attempt to creating a business case and we will roll out our program as it was initially planned, but we will not put additional funding. And so there was a very interesting moment for us uh, in which we said, this is gonna be either our biggest success or our most brutal failure. And by Friday, the day before the end of January, uh, February 29th, it was Friday 28th, um, end of business day, we had received one letter of intent for 1.5 million, which is 10% of what we needed to achieve. So I started drafting the mail to the board saying to them, we have practically failed at creating that business case. Um, and it was only, uh, you can play that video because this is something that we played on social media um, during that week. So if you can go back a little bit. No, that was the slide before, Vinny. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and so basically we started, we started really trying to, you can just play that one. We started really trying to uh, give the messaging that there is a strong connection between the challenge you're trying to address of child, uh, of child labor and what we're proposing to do, which is treating the problem at the level in which it, it occurred.
At that point in time, we were um, fearing that there would be not enough commitments. And during that weekend, we passed the minimum mark to launch it. And I'm very happy to say that yesterday, we released a media um, um, a release launching Clay and Elan as, as, as facilities. And this happened particularly in a, in a very interesting time, proving that business case, which is a time where everyone is focused on the COVID crisis, on uh, restoring health systems, and in directing funding towards um, everything else that has to do with uh, social uh, impact rather than, than quality of education. So um, this is where the case stands today. The work is still ahead of us, but we're very confident that we're in the right path to get in there. So what would be, uh, we will go now for a couple of questions, but what would be the key takeaways, if you want, on how you build these grand coalitions with different incentives? How do you make it stick? We, look, we heard that you need to make uh, the business case, but what is about the, the execution and the different interests? What, what do you think are the key pieces of the puzzle for other corporates that may want to apply this to different topics and to different issues you now? Well, the first takeaway is that um, SDG4, quality education, has material effect on almost any business and any government. But in the long term, bringing that value to present day requires very careful analysis of opportunities related to either diminishing risks or increasing business uh, um, returns in the present term. Sometimes it has to do with visibility, as somebody was asking at the beginning. Sometimes it has to do with uh, an effective way of doing things that is easy to engage in. And sometimes, and, and most times, that has to do with building trust between different parties that can support each other to get more out of uh, that investment than they would do individually. But there is one more aspect. One last aspect that I have to mention here is a very critical be uh, enabler that uh, we were not expecting, and that is human um, ethics and morals. So a lot of the people in companies today are there because they had an education that opened doors for them. And um, just that very humbling reminder that somebody made that decision for you is sometimes powerful enough to go through the loops of studying, making the case, proposing and putting it out on the table and making companies and decisions that uh, institutions take be aligned with giving that door an open for other generations to come. We have a Stefania asking you too, do you have a, a, a gender lens or a gender uh, side uh, that you're working on the quality of education or an investment? Absolutely. Yeah. Today we do. Uh, I must say this is a new gen. It's a new lens we put in about two years uh, into the program because uh, what we started seeing is that uh, of the levels of uh, uh, discrimination and, and and suffering of learners, you have first the fact of being a rural uh, uh, learner, secondly the fact of being a poor rural learner, and third the fact of being a, a female, a woman, um, a girl within the, one of these communities. So is the one group that suffers the most and therefore where we have to focus as well in terms of the solutions, of course. And we have here a question from Ian Charles and he's asking, how do you, how can we better educate the public about the complexities to prevent knee jerking single focus action uh, that may do more good, harm than good in, this, in issues like this? You no, know, so that we don't divert funding into things that do not work. Well, uh, and this is one of the most uh, uh, underestimated uh, problems in the philanthropic and impact investing industry. A lot of the decisions about impact are made based on personal preferences or simple perceptions, um, but not based on evidence and data. And that is a painful fact because millions are being invested into um, solutions that haven't even been tested for effectiveness, like ed techs and, and so on and so forth. 99.5% of all ed techs in the world haven't had a test for effectiveness. So how do we go there? Let's look at what evidence is saying. There are outlets of evidence like IPA, Innovations for Poverty Action, mm -hmm. who basically collect randomized controlled trials about what works and what doesn't and why. And I would just recommend to start looking at what that evidence tells us and then not reinventing wheel or going with our own perceptions or preferences. Right. Ravi is also asking, uh, do you feel that adding a vocational angle to quality education will shorten the payback. And there was another question too, if that quality education help, helps people to have better jobs in the future. So do you make, do you work on that connection between better livelihoods and better jobs uh, in the investments? 
Vocational training is one of the most material areas of education, much more than early childhood development or even primary education. It's more closely related to the core business. You can have squads of youth, for example, doing pruning or spraying in a safe way um, in, in the cocoa communities and therefore even uh, increasing their income. We tried with that area. It's one of the failures we, we, we have had to face, but we didn't have enough, um, let's say, uh, opportunities to take that to scale. And part of that was that the cocoa and chocolate industry was so overwhelmed by the pressure being put on them on the child labor issue that something that is closer to their core business got less, less attention. I'm sorry, I forgot the yeah. second question. No, but I think that was okay. So here, uh, M. Hirsch, as I don't know the first name, uh, is asking... Do you think that this is also replicable and scalable from your side to other focus area, or is it just this for the cocoa sector? Uh, can you launch such a pro projects in, like with no cluster but mobilize major corporates and other stakeholders? Are you well, thinking this is, about doing this that? Is, this is our objective. Um, so as we begin a, a next a strategic cycle in 2021 uh, to 2030, we're going to invest half a billion dollars in learning. And what we're going to do is to take the Trek approach or the Clay and Elan approaches to neighboring Ghana to see if in another cocoa and chocolate country, the same dynamics can be seen. But we're also going to take it out of there to a middle income country that could be in Latin America or in Asia. We're still trying to uh, make a decision of where we could test that. And we're going to take it to a high resource environment, also to demonstrate that this approach does not depend on the level of income, but rather on the type of partnership you create, the trust that you put in place, and the intersection between evidence and policy. There is also a question if you're focusing uh, too on health promotion, if that affects also quality education, if you do any investments in that area from Sabrina. From our side, we don't do uh, investments in health other than including health in the compendiums and the curriculum of the education programs that we support to develop. But we, don't, we ourselves don't invest on, on say, WASH or, or any other uh, health interventions directly. We partner with others who do in those communities. Juliana is asking, what is the framework to monitor that if the investments are achieving the, the desired outcome? So, and improving child education through time. You know? So what are you doing? What framework are you using? Oh, this is one of the most exciting parts of this program. We have a, a, an organization called Enveritas, who is doing uh, uh, satellite imagery and underground surveys and building this rich uh, data uh, on maps that allows us to monitor over time what is changing in terms of schools' quality of education, as well as in child labor over time. And that is you know, a, a, a layered approach that can allow you to also see what investments have been done in other areas like health or infrastructure, and therefore allowing everyone around the table to have a very clear, very transparent tool to make decisions of efficiency of capital use. Right. Maria uh, is asking, she's saying it's often told in, in Western Europe, and I think we can hear this everywhere right now, that educational systems are not prepared to meet the challenges of today and even less of tomorrow. No? So we need to reform. So what are the opportunities in developing countries where you're working and how do you work with that? And I think probably if you can mention some of how you work alliances with, with the government or what other things you did in, in this arena. Well, I mean, we started this, this talk by saying that most uh, systems, independently of, of the income level of the country, are failing students. And um, we are right now in a virtual seminar as opposed to a face-to-face -face one because we're all together in the largest experiment humanity has ever entered into the world of technology and virtual. Um, and taking this forward allows us to open possibilities that a month ago were unthinkable for governments of different uh, parts of the world. Middle-income countries have an advantage over the low-income countries, which is a reception of phones and some basic infrastructure that allows us to really test what technologies can help us reach um, the, the, the least advantage and the more uh, rural populations. But it won't happen just by putting technology on the table. We have to put thoughts and we have to put evidence on what works in that case and what doesn't. Good. So I'm going to start wrapping up, but getting into uh, there's a last question from Christina. Or if you have a couple like last questions, please right now because we're almost reaching the time. And she's actually actually asking, uh, are you only looking for funding from corporates? Uh, what other things can corporates bring to the table other than investment? I think you mentioned a little bit about working on their value chain, but if you can add, or it's just the, the money from the funding that has only come from corporates. What what can you comment on that? 
That's a very good question, and, and thank you for asking that. Um, oftentimes, when everybody talks about SDGs, we all agree that governments alone cannot fund them. The philanthropic sector money is a drop in the bucket if you consider only foundations working on these issues, and that you need private sector engagement and financing to do that. However, the challenge that we're seeing a lot of the times is that the discussion starts when you go to the corporates and say, hey, guys, here's an SDG, give me money to do it. And that's all you ask of them. If you don't add value, if you don't use their logic, their tools, their years of scaling um, um, businesses, their focus on objectives, their narrow view of managing efficiency of resources, you're leaving most of the contributions from the private sector on the table and outside. And that could be mobilized towards the creation of impact. So if you're able to create systems and programs that mobilize not only capital, but knowledge and, and networks, you will be much in, a, in a much better position to create impact that otherwise wouldn't occur. And in, in that side of, of mobilizing not only financial capital, but other types of capital, now what role do international organizations like UNICEF or ILO have on this? Do they broker trust? How they how do you work? Because I know this is a grand coalition. Yeah. UNICEF, for example, in the case of our program, has been a key player providing the frameworks that enable everybody to speak the same language and start um, having a transaction of trust. When you come from a, from a position of not being able to speak with each other because you don't know what the other is going to ask, you know, this is the position of companies to the government, or because you feel the government is going to take over your agenda, having a known name that has a mission to help children flourish like UNICEF, provide the frameworks in which these transactions can happen is tremendously helpful and help us uh, move forward the discussion that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Great, and I think last question from Marianne is what kind of feedback do you receive? Actually, I'm reading if, uh, of your excellent work from the global organizations working with you, like the WHO, from the Ellen Carto Foundation, OECD. Do you get any feedback from other organizations? Well, we, we are sitting in the, uh, 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 we're chairing the uh, network of foundations working for development of OECD, which is a pleasure to do so. And I guess this is a feedback and recognition that something that we're doing can help us also mobilize change in the philanthropic sector. Um, the feedback that we're receiving from UNICEF is that um, we will work together, that they will back this process up in due time, and that they will seek forms in which the trust can be continued to be built between different stakeholders. And the feedback that we're receiving from the World Bank is a, a coalition whereby we're blending finance from the private sector, this is us and our, and our partners, to what their programs are in lending to governments according to their plans. So I think this feedback is very much reflected in actions and, and we are feeling that we're going in the right direction with these organizations as well. So good. So to close up, uh, I, I want to really thank you for, for your your amazing and inspirational uh, chat that you had with all of us today. And we have just a little video to watch, but I, I really hope we can extend this. And I want to say uh, this is part of the mission of the LEA Center for Social Innovation at IMD is to have you all that are participating. If you have great experiences to share and you want to be part of a future webinar telling your story, or if you want us to help you build these kinds of, of coalitions, because the idea is that this webinar should inspire action now post-COVID crisis or how we can speed up the process of corporate transformation and not do it alone and how precisely we build the business case, we align uh, the different incentives and interests, how international organizations can be, be bringing trust and knowledge on the language, how can we bridge uh, philanthropic money that the risk projects for the private sector to scale those uh, solutions and how the government creates a framework also to multiply and to leverage the access they have. So how these very complex things that some I think in some cases may sound like science fictions are becoming a reality and, and I think are part of the dream that we have at IMD to become enablers of these, these kinds of process. So I would love to share a last video. Uh,
Excellent. So thank you, everybody, for the participation. Uh, you have here uh, my contact. I don't know if you can see it. Let me share my contact if you want to contact me. Thank you very much, Fabio, for your extremely generous participation. And I hope we can continue being partners in crime uh, documenting and, and building this type of coalition. So, Anytime. And thank, thank you, everyone, you so for taking much, the time everyone. this morning to join us and to speak with us this morning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Good.